So they are fellow Greeks, friends, distinguished uh, academics and uh, visitors from Greece. I would like to welcome you all to this uh, uh, historic uh, building of the Consulate General of Greece in Boston, erected in 1910 and designed by Edmund Wilwright, uh, the architect who designed and who was the uh, who was in charge of the Longfellow Bridge uh, project, among many other projects. Uh, so thanks to uh, generosity of, uh, uh, of friends of the consulate, like uh, Robert McCabe, we installed, one, we installed one year ago a permanent exhibition of photographs of uh, Greece. And thanks to uh, friends like uh, uh, Daphne Hadzopoulos, we just up upgraded our interior space and our carpets. We have a huge, beautiful carpet next door. We changed uh, one of our spaces. And thank you very much, uh, Daphne, for that. Uh, today's event is happening uh, thanks to Alexandra and, uh, and Ilia Samaras. Σας ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ. They are the sponsors of the event. And uh, thanks to Alexandra and Ilias. Uh, Ilias is also the IT department of uh, today's event. <laughs> uh, we changed completely the architectural lighting, lighting of uh, our first floor and we made one large space, the space that is next door and where you can see the video, the other video and documentary on Piconis. And this large office space is now uh, available to, uh, to the public. Σας ευχαριστώ πολύ και σας είμαι ευγνώμων. Uh, all uh, uh, of your support has uh, enabled us to make this consulate a center for promoting Greek uh, culture. And if this, the stars are aligned in the near future, uh, a hub for scientific diplomacy and innovation too. Uh, in Greece, we have an expression, we say, Tin historia tin grafune i pares. So history is be being written by groups of friends. And tonight's uh, Tonight's event was inspired two summers ago uh, in Paros during a dinner party of Marina Hadzopoulos. Uh, I remember uh, meeting then Alexandra uh, Samaras who mentioned uh, that she was the granddaughter of Picionis. And uh, I could not believe it. I was like a doubting Thomas. <laughs> and I said then, why don't we organize a Boston event at the Consulate uh, of Greece in, in Boston? to honor the legacy of Picionis, and uh, the rest is, is history. I would like to express my uh, appreciation to the Benaki Museum for allowing us to use its uh, archival material and its uh, video on Picionis, directed by Athinara Hiltzagari and produced by Phileon Productions. I'd like uh, to also thank ERT, the Hellenic Broadcasting Agency, and Angelos Kovotsos, the director of the Paraskinio documentary. I would like to uh, uh, recognize uh, Hashim Harkis, the dean of the MIT School of Architecture, who is here tonight, Tane Ayatridis, senior director of uh, university planning of Harvard, uh, Professor Konstantin Arvanitopoulos, the Karamalis chair for Hellenic and European uh, studies at uh, Fletcher, uh, and so, so many of, uh, of, of you. I, I, but I think it is important to recognize 10 Greek students from the Harvard Graduate School of Design who found out that there is an event on Picionis and uh, they asked us to participate. And uh, uh, I think this is a proof that Picionis spirit and heritage is uh, still alive. And uh, I would like to thank my uh, two colleagues at the consulate, Mirella Kukuchi and Niki Panagiotou. We are changing our whole team and right now I had to be on with only two persons, but with an army of uh, volunteers and interns uh, who, uh, whom I would like to thank very much because they, are, uh, they helped us uh, you know, uh, running and doing things uh, and pants above our weight. Uh, and, uh, uh, last but not least, happy name day to Michel uh, Vunatsos, the CEO of Biogen, to Michalis, Michalis Bletsas uh, fro, from MIT and to Michalis uh, Karamanis from MIT. I might forget another Michael or Angelo, but uh, happy name day to everybody. Uh, so, uh, dear friends, we, 
we all witness in our countries the destructive effects of uh, human intervention in our cultural, architectural and natural landscape. This makes us Greeks grateful to Picionis for having preserved, protected and given prominence through his landscaping intervention to the most important of our national monuments, the Acropolis, this very symbol of Greece. I could say actually that there is a, an interesting dialogue in the consulate between the pictures of Picionis, of Picionis uh, that uh, Alexandra brought to the consulate, uh, because Picionis managed to preserve uh, and uh, really promote the surroundings around the Acropolis, and also the pictures of McCabe that have uh, immortalized the Greece that is never uh, alive anymore in this shape and in this uh, nature. And I would like to say about Picionis that he was a prolific personality, an architect, painter, and writer, a colossal figure in Greek architecture, a person who traveled extensively in Greece and abroad and who was in constant dialogue with the theories, arts, and ideas of his era. What makes him different and special, in my opinion, is that he didn't just import all these theories mechanically to Greece, like Nobel laureate Odysseus Elitis in poetry, and Mikis Sodorakis and Manos Hadzidakis in music. Picionis got acquainted with, absorbed, and filtered the best he could from the uh, world and combined them with the Greek tradition. Uh, I cannot think anyone else who uh, can best present to us Picionis' legacy than his uh, granddaughter, Alexandra Samaras, and Picionis' students, Constantin Doxiadis' great nephew, Thomas uh, Doxiadis. Thank you both for uh, being with us tonight and for making this uh, uh, event possible. Alexandra Samaras is a practicing architect for over 35 years with numerous publications on, on uh, her work. She has received a Bachelor of Architecture and Fine Arts from the Rhode Island School of Design. She attended visual and environmental studies at Harvard and she received a Master of Architecture from Columbia University where she was awarded a scholarship and taught as an adjunct professor in the Department of Architecture. Excerpts from her thesis, Picionis and his work, submitted to the Rhode Island School of Design, first appeared in the Architectural Association's 1989 publication, A Sentimental Topolo Topography, and since then her thesis has been used as a reference, her thesis on Picionis, uh, in countless publication, publications around the world. Her projects range from commercial to residential buildings and are located in the United States, Greece and the United Arab Emirates. Alexandra was part of the design team for the 2004 Athens Olympic Games and she's the founding sponsor for the Dimitris Picionis Award for Outstanding Academic Performance at Harvard University. With great admiration, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Alexandra Samaras, who is the soul of this event and please a round of applause for Alexandra. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here tonight. Among so many dear friends, old friends, distinguished guests, and many of you came from distant places, from New York, New Hampshire, California, and Greece, in fact. Thank you, Thomas, for being here tonight. And I can speak on behalf of many of us here that our Council General Staratos Eftimio also deserves a warm thanks. He's a unique... <laughs> He's a unique individual with his own vision, sometimes ambitious vision, <laughs> but one that has inspired us all. Aside from being... 
Aside from being a notable architect, Picionis was also my grandfather. On a personal note, growing up, I was frequently told how much he admired Northern Greece and the architecture, the vernacular architecture of Northern Greece, such as uh, areas uh, such as Zagora and towns in Pilio. And he would study these towns together with his students and document the architecture there. I, I always thought that if the architecture is so great in, in these areas, then perhaps the people are too. Well, as fate would have it, I met my husband, Elias, who is from northern Greece in Manhattan. <laughs> and he is also my very important IT resource tonight, so that if anything does go wrong, <laughs> we can blame it on fate. Tonight marks the first event ever to be held on Dimitris Picionis in the United States, outside of academic communities. Picionis's work holds a unique place in Greece's modern history, a history with an immense cultural heritage. Picionis was aware of this at a time when Western influences were widely accepted. He dedicated his life to the preservation of Greece's unique identity. He welcomed modernism within a local context. He selectively researched and incorporated regional prototypes and archetypes from antiquity in the Byzantine period. These are images of graves that were actually found during the construction of the paths that he embedded in his paths. He embedded mystical symbolism by placing these marble ledger grave markers and constructed uh, plans that were relative to Greece, such as the Byzantine church. He placed Hellenistic tombstones that were scattered all around the area in the Acropolis hillside and Philopapu at very specific locations. And you can see him sketching them in his initial drawings. And then again at the entrance to the St. Lubardiadis church, he, he used them um, as landmarks. He also found um, old ancient pottery fragments and used them as a mosaic to represent images of Greece. And here he uh, also used pieces from demolished um, neoclassical buildings to create benches. They were being discarded um, as modern buildings were coming, uh, being made in Athens. They started demolishing the neoclassical buildings. But this recycling process that was, it was actually very common in ancient and Byzantine uh, <coughs> building practices is something that he continued. This is a view at the Belvedere, which is uh, the Philopapu Hill across from the Acropolis. He strategically located these resting points and viewpoints. And this project fundamentally uh, shows the, the values in his work. It is a collage of the past and the present. He drew lessons from creative resources, such as the Greek tragedies and philosophers Socrates and Plato, from historians such as Kaburoglu, from the nationally significant songs, poetry, painting, literary works of Calvos, Cavafis, Solomos, Kelianos, Heraclitis, Kodoglu, Yanopoulos, Kazantzakis, and many more. His work is characteristically metaphysical, and deeply rooted in all that in essence is Greek. Picionis reverted to these archetypal forms when all had been lost after nearly 400 years of Ottoman rule and decades of war. He sought to reconnect his country with its timeless, fundamental, and inner identity. This is a very brief list of awards and exhibitions and lectures on his work. Um, very recently at the Stavros Nierjos Foundation, there was a series of lectures. The Benaki Museum had an exten extensive exhibition. <coughs> Picionis's work is a discourse between modern ideology and cultural context, between built form and the natural environment. 
It is based on ancient nature worshiping beliefs and building aesthetics where harmony is achieved not by the ruler, but by the naked eye. His work is nationally and internationally acclaimed. Here we can see the Carlos Scarpa Award that he received, and he was uh, unanimously elected to receive the UNESCO Award. A quote from the architect, historian, and Ware professor at Columbia University, Kenneth Frampton, which was presented in the brochure for the 1991 Biennale, states that it is the almost ecological insistence on the interdependency of culture and nature which gives Picionis' work a critical edge that is relevant today as it was 30 years ago. And a very brief personal history on Picionis is that he was born in Piraeus. This is his home in 1887. His parents were from Chios. His father was the son of a ship owner and he cultivated his sense of proportion. His mother heightened his sense of human morality and he developed his consciousness for the land from his long walks in his youth through the landscape of Attica. His cousin, the poet Lambros Porfirios, revealed poems by Solomos who wrote hymns about the people, the topography of Greece, and the Greek national anthem. Picionis received his degree in civil engineering at the National Technical University of Athens in 1908, complying with his parents' wishes, although his true vocation was to become a painter. Painting inspired him. He would frequently visit the School of Fine Arts, where he became friends with De Chirico, Buzianis. He met Parthenis, whose paintings fused modern elements with ancient Byzantine and European. Picionis became his first student. He traveled to Munich and Paris to study painting. He was particularly he particularly admired Paul Cezanne's rendering of depth through color. You can see similarities. This is a painting by Picionis of the Sacred Way, but similarities in his painting to Cezanne's work. Cezanne was considered to be the father of modern art. He replaced strict realism and linear perspective with a revolutionary color technique. This is a, a photograph of my grandfather and my grandmother together. He, he married Alexandra Anastasiu, a refugee from a Asia Minor, and together they had five children. He gave his children ancient Greek names. These are four of the five children. They're, Picionis is in the middle. My mother is to the far left. Uh, you know, many of you know. <laughs> um, he gave his children ancient Greek names. Uh, my mother, Ino, also an architect, was Picionis' first child. I am his second grandchild. My, my brother is his first grandchild. Um, and she studied at the National Technical University of Athens, and her thesis was on the Japanese home. Um, it is an interesting coincidence, as in Picionis' work, uh, he welcomed Eastern influences which are closely related to the ideals of Greece in a spiritual world, while he rejected Western influences. This is the entrance to the Lubardiaris church, which actually um, bears a striking resemblance to Japanese shrine, where gates are used to mark a boundary between the holy ground and the secular world. So he welcomed Eastern influences, uh, but rejected Western influences, which he felt were more representative of, of science and technology. My father, Alexis Papagiorgio, was his associate during the realization of many of his mature works. Um, this is a drawing uh, by uh, Picionis of a landscape in Aegina. And Picionis was part of the dynamic generation of the 30s, Igenia du Triada, um, a group of like-minded thinkers who shared an aesthetic, ideological, and spiritual conviction to rebuild and strengthen their country. This drawing by Picionis reflects the tendencies in art at the time to depict an unspoiled Greece with a low horizon, a big sky, and the prevailing presence of nature as the unifying element of everything created by man. 
This is um, my grandparents' home in Aegina. My first memories of Greece are the many summers I spent in this home. It's a modest structure, one very large room that served as a living dining and bedroom for all. I remember my grandmother frequently being annoyed by my brother who enjoyed submerging himself in her carefully ordered pillows which she found scattered on the floor every morning. Um, <laughs> not very uh, architectural but I remember that. I remember a, a wood engine cover which is at the can see it right there, um, at the ed end of the room that hung on the living room wall. This same found object was, became the inspiration for a vernacular image that was carved into the stone at the Belvedere in Filopapu, which you can see here. Um, and that's the, the cover. And, and the same image flipped became very similar to the cover itself. Uh, something he did frequently, he used found objects, vernac vernacular, ancient uh, objects, and he incorporated that into his work and uh, drew inspiration from that. Um, again, this same uh, image appears in, in a gift that was given to him by uh, Andonis Vuzvuzis, who wrote a book on a monk um, who uh, was very famous for sp spreading the concept of uh, Christian monasticism um, in Western Europe. But the same image appeared here, which was in about 1944, long before the Belvedere was made. Um, on the left, this side, is, is his personal uh, history and, and some events from it. And on the right is, is history itself and um, the many wars that occurred during his lifetime. The blue line is the period where he actually um, practiced architecture. Um, Greece's independence in 1830 marks a period of crucial development and European classicism was welcomed. Many public buildings, schools were based on European classicism, classical style. A period of unrest followed, the Asia Minor Disaster, the Greco-Turkish War on, on this timeline, um, brought roughly one and a half million refugees into Greece, which was about one-fifth of the country's population at the time. Uh, modern architecture appeared in the 1920s, offering quick, cost-effective solutions to the soaring housing demands. At that time, the neoclassical buildings were demolished and replaced with modern apartment blocks. In 1933, the International Congress for Modern Architecture was held in, in Athens. And it was led by the most prominent architects whose objectives were to spread the principles of modern architecture. Picionis initially, as you can see in this project, which is the elementary school at Pefkakia, at Likaviton, he embraced the ideals of modern architecture. Um, but upon the completion of this project, he dismissed it. He felt that it was not appropriate. Uh, he felt that this universal approach must be joined with the spirit of the nation. Uh, this is an image of Picionis with, this is Caramalis, Picionis, Anastasio Sorlados, who, historian, architect, uh, responsible for the restoration of many of the archaeological sites in uh, Greece, and um, Giannis Miliadis, uh, director of the Acropolis, and then two other individuals that came, I think, with Karamalis. The 1950s. Alexander Tsonis and Alkis Tirodi, in their book Greece, Modern Architectures and History, dubbed the 1950s as the halcyon days, Yalkionides Meres. They described this tranquil period of happiness as a period when cultural creativity flourished and was marked by commitment to innovation and change combined with dedication to realism, regionalism. 
The Association of Greek Art Critics was founded in 1950. Their aim was to revitalize critical discourse in the arts, and Picionis was a founding member. This is an aerial of um, Philopapu Hill and the Acropolis Hill, and the yellow lines designate the paths and the work that Picionis did, the, that he did in that area. Um, and you can see how it almost appears as if it's a rope that's gently uh, superimposed on, on top of the hillside. It's a very gentle, rather than a very vertical um, uh, method of um, presenting his paths. Um, so, Konstantinos Karamalis, the, the Minister of Public Works, in 1954, and the future Prime Minister, appointed Picionis with the landscape around the Acropolis and Philopapu Hill. And the purpose was to provide access to the Acropolis and to connect the archaeological sites. The task included town planning, restoration, this is the Lubardiaris Church, this is what they consider the Picionis intersection, and this path goes up to the Acropolis, which is here, and a, a smaller path here. And this is Papu Hill. And it fo there's a smaller path here, which uh, actually follows some, uh, the Atichisma, an ancient wall, and arrives at the Belvedere. These two points were strategically located for their, their view, as a viewpoint, it's, uh, towards the Acropolis. <coughs> But when, uh, when Picionis uh, started, the, the first thing he did was to remove the existing asphalt roads. The red lines here are the asphalt roads that were created in 1930. They were located in the immediate vicinity of the Propilia, severing the connection between the monuments. This is um, what replaced the asphalt. It's uh, the stone uh, pathways that Picionis created. This is actually a drawing that was done by my, my father, uh, Alex Pap Papayoriu. Uh, and uh, shows the, the differences between them. Picionis immediately met with strong opposition from the Attica engineers, the construction department, the Ministry of Public Transportation, who attacked his work and insisted that he be stopped when he tried to remove the existing paving. To further exacerbate these pressures, Picionis opted for a manual approach, as is commonly seen in vernacular Greece, or the layman's approach, where no mechanical equipment is used. All is done by hand. This is Picionis working on site, which is what he would do day in and day out. He worked on, with a group of about 40 wood and stone masons at a time when speed was being promoted and city planning catered to the proliferation of the automobile. Picionis wrote to Caramalis to emphasize the unique nature of the area, that it demands personal attention. He asserted that the task of the architect in this case must rise above the ephemeral and circumstantial concepts typical of our age that current methods of primarily working remotely from the office would not suffice. He insisted that it is our duty to be extremely careful in executing a project of this nature, which is not merely based on a mechanical act, but rather an artistic one. Caramalis would meet with Picionis every morning on his way to work. In his soft voice, Picionis would speak of Greece's long history the significance of place and moral meaning alongside the evolving paths. Caramalis was fascinated. Picionis convinced him that, this, that his method of implementation was the most appropriate one for this sensitive site. These meetings played an essential role in allowing the project to continue unimpeded and within a reasonable time frame. This is, um, uh-oh. Um, it shows the chiseled stone and how he would uh, 
manually used old techniques uh, on the stone uh, in part to add necessary surface traction and um, textural internations. Picionis assembled a team, of, uh, a team of students, proceeded by employing manual vernacular techniques of construction, many of which had to be rekindled. They didn't exist. They don't exist now, but he had to rekindle them. Our task is to interpret and construct, as Picionis would say, to build through the hands of the craftsman. Um, these paths, uh, Picionis, uh, these paths were actually uh, led by the, the students themselves that were working for Picionis, and I'll explain why. Um, Picionis employed the <coughs> Socratic method both as a teacher, he was a teacher for 35 years at the School of Architecture in uh, the National Technical University of Athens, and with colleagues, uh, he employed the same system with colleagues in his practice. He encouraged creative thinking. As one of his students, Alexander Papayorio Venetas, explains that he would inspire and guide the interests of each student or colleague, allowing them to work according to their own inclinations. The, the width I have to mention of these two, the two paths, the very wide width, is really not according to Picionis's wishes. They are a result of pressures exerted by the Ministry of Transportation. Uh, who succeeded in gaining approval for restricted vehicular access to facilitate state visitors. Here, Picionis's background in civil engineering came to play. Um, these stones were actually recessed into a, a very thick layer of sand and contained within the concrete patterns, keeping them in place under the weight of vehicular traffic. These paths uh, represent a neoplastic um, interplay of concrete and stone. He entrusted his students to lead in the design of the paths, which are in Filopapu, in the Filopapu area, and more distant uh, from the Acropolis. They face an expanding city, and they more freely embrace new methods. Picciones fre frequently uses abstract lines to interrupt any sense of linear perspective. The paths themselves, they're an intricate act of art. They're, they're made from scrap marble uh, found at Pentelic and Marathon quarries. And you can see in these images how the edges recede and project into the natural landscape. That water flows through a playful system of stone and concrete gutters. That the paths yield to nature in the, oh, uh, there's a tree and they, they yield and, and around rocks and existing trees. Uh, that they, they yield to nature and redirect around existing trees and rocks. They faithfully follow remnants of ancient walls. Here is the, the Atijisma, 4th century BC wall. Um, and, and he used uh, he relied on sensory perception, how we naturally experience space. He guides the visitor through continuous connecting paths that meander through the trees. He provides nodal points and shaded rest stops and select viewpoints. This is um, the Belvedere. And uh, it, during construction, they found um, a Pelasgian troglodyte settlement, which is from 3000 BC. Um, this is the, uh, the water well that was used by the troglodytes uh, to catch distilled water. It also is, was located at a very um, appropriate angle from the Acropolis. Uh, it's about 30 degrees to see, to see the, to, from where to enjoy the temples. Another characteristic in his work is that he used very wide and deeply recessed joints which governed his compositions. This is an image of Picionis with Doxiadis. <laughs> um, Costandinos Doxiadis was one of his students. And Picionis, the, the, 
Piconis' structures, the pa pavilion and the church, are located on a basis of distance and polar coordinates that radiate from the observer. Um, Piconis applied the same system of radial vantage points found in Costantinos Luxiadis' dissertation, the theory on the use of viewpoints in ancient Greek architecture, here is, um, which was published in, uh, in the Third Eye in 1937, a periodical instigated by Piconis, and then to the left is a floor plan with showing the radial lines and the composition at Lubardiadis Church. The, the third eye, I, I should mention, was uh, intended to fill the gap in cultural influences at the time. They had articles on proportion, <coughs> cosmology, ethnography, Japanese gardens, the works of Cezanne, Kandinsky, Clay. <coughs> And here you can see it um, in, during the construction, the use of radial lines. This is an image of uh, Lubardiai's church. I, I believe not long after it was completed. It, it looks a little different now. The vegetation has grown dramatically. Um, the name itself, Lubardiai's or can Cannoneer, uh, comes from, um, is associated with a miracle that occurred in 1658 when a Turkish commander's attempt to bomb the church from the Prapilia on the commemorating night of Saint Dimitrios failed. Uh, many elements um, from Greek vernacular as well as ideas associated with Japanese temples and gardens culminated in Pionis's work and here at Lubardiaris in particular. Uh, we can see um, stone uh, footings, um, elevated uh, ground floor, um, and, and the use of natural materials. Uh, this is from fine brush uh, for, the, for the pavilion. Kazantzakis revealed the world of Japan to Pikionis because Kazantzakis actually traveled there while well, Pikionis did not. But through his travels, um, Picciones discovered the Japanese gardens. Um, Picciones uses natural materials that, in their original state, such as the roofing material, the thyme, and the unprocessed local pine. And similar to the Japanese temples, he has elevated the floor and used stone footings. The stone footings, I would say, is also common in churches in Piglio. He employs a monastic theme for his design uh, at St. Lubardiaris. Um, if uh, the, the church itself, the exonarthics, the pavilion and the outdoor spaces, the flanking porches and the narrow benches create a sense of enclosure similar to that of a monastery. You can see how he carefully selected the view for the pavilion to have an unobstructed view of the Acropolis. Again, his civil engineering um, knowledge is apparent here, the use of t diagonal bracing um, uh, to stabilize the structure from lateral loads. The pavilion was intended to function as a place for convenient, convenient which, convening, uh, which is customary to Greek villages, um, and a place for rest away from the bustling city. Picionis was stringently against the commercialization of this area. He uh, allowed the, the, it to function as a coffee shop where they would serve uh, only drinks and Greek traditional sweets. These are details of the pediment at the church. This is the northern pediment. Um, and below is a sketch and above is the final version of it. Um, the church itself is extensively embellished with mythological symbols, such as the single-headed eagle, in this case, which is here, um, symbolizing power, which, and the eagle itself is capturing a pregnant hare, which symbolizes procreation and immortality, and to the right here is a snake, uh, <coughs> symbolizing wisdom, healing, and as they shed their skin, they are thought of as symbols of rebirth. 
The facades of the church were joint efforts of Picionis and his many artist friends who participated in the construction. <coughs> and this is the south pediment. Picionis had ties with many prominent figures throughout the course of his life. He was in correspondence with the distinguished historian Louis Mumford. In Mumford's letter to Picionis, he commends his work and states that it grows from deep human foundations. That this was a time just following World War II, where there was a proliferation of nuclear weapon, weapons. Um, and Mumford comments um, deep uh, that. Uh, my daily prayer is that works like these will survive our present nuclear and lunar madness and help restore us to our humanity. Picionis was also in communication with the founder of the Bauhaus, Walter Gropius. We don't know exactly when they first met, other than this letter, uh, March 24, 1960. This is uh, in, in the Gropius house in Lincoln, Massachusetts, and uh, a gift, uh, kudos, that uh, Picionis gave to, to Gropius. My aunt suggested to me that they may have become acquainted through Costandinos Doxiadis. Uh, she also mentioned that Gropius confessed to Picionis to having borrowed his design for the steps at Lubardiaris Pavilion for his own design for the steps at the U.S. Embassy in Greece. Picionis visited the United States in 1967. I remember my father stating that he was impressed by the country's infrastructure. Gropius and Picionis met for the last time at an art event organized by the architect, historian, and professor of visual arts and architecture, Edward Seckler, and his team at the Carpenter Center for the Visual Arts. Notably, the only building designed by Le Corbusier in the United States. Gropius had recently returned from Japan and was describing his visit with enthusiasm, a subject that Picionis greatly welcomed. As my father describes their meeting in his unpublished manuscript on Gropius and Picionis, the two leaders withdrew from the crowd and devoted themselves to their conversation. This is a quote by Plotinus, which uh, a philosopher that emphasized the metaphysical side of uh, Platonic philosophy. A quote that Picionis frequently refers to um, as an approach in life to use insight as opposed to sight, to see beyond our normal vision. Picionis was ahead of his time, his interdisciplinary methods, his respect for the environment, and cultural values. His enduring and timeless approach, his belief in moral correctness, reaffirms qualities we hope for and strive for today. His work is subtle, non-invasive, immersed in deep meaning, and humanizes our environment. This is an image of Picionis and me in New York City, <laughs> in front of Mises Seagram building, a curtain glass wall skyscraper, in the heart of Manhattan, uh, Picionis was a meek man uh, with a vision that empowered him to successfully rebel against accepted norms of his time. He planted the seed for future, for future generations to aspire to and move forward using their own inclinations for a better tomorrow. Thank you. So um, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Thomas uh, uh, Doxiadis, an internationally recognized Greek architect and landscape architect. It is our honor to have you here. Thank you for coming for, from, from Greece. Um, Thomas uh, has founded in 1999 uh, the architecture landscape practice Doxiadis Plus in Athens, Greece. Uh, the practice has received awards such as the 2010 Architectural Review Emerging Architecture Awards, the first prize for the urban space 
in front of the New Acropolis Museum, the 2007 competition for the regeneration of the square of, the, of heroes of LFCs, and the 2017 American Society of Landscape Architects Honor Award, among others. Uh, Thomas, he, Thomas received his BA, uh, his Master of Architecture, Master of Landscape Architecture at Harvard University. He has received academic awards such as the Harvard College Scholarship, the Thomas Hoops Prize, Rudolf Arnheim Prize, and the Penny White Award. Following his uh, studies in, uh, in, in Boston, and this is one more connection with Boston and Doxiadis and his legacy and Greek architecture, Thomas returned to Greece in 1999, where he was a section manager of the Athens Olympics organizing committee responsible for landscape and look of the city. Concurrently, he was advisor to the Organization for the Planning of Athens. He has taught in the University of Patras and he currently heads the Climate Adaptation for Landscapes work package for the National Adaptation Program. It is our honor to have you here. Thank you very, very much. It's my honor and pleasure to be here. I'll figure out how this works. Okay. So, does this sound right? Thank you. General Counsel Christo Stratos Efimiu. Um, I did indeed call Boston home for nine years. Uh, one of those as head of the Harvard Hellenic Association and remember the consulate fondly, but I have to say it looks much, much better now. <laughs> uh, thank you, Alexandra, for having me join you in this presentation. I, I know Picionis intimately through his work and through his relationship with Konstantinos Doxiadis. I'm now very happy to get to know you better and to see Picionis through the eyes of his family. I follow your moving and thought-provoking presentation with a focus reading on the paths to the Acropolis. My own relationship to the landscape created by Picionis has been in studying it over the last 25 years, not as a scholar but as a practicing landscape architect. I also have the fortune to live in Plaka, and the walk around the Acropolis is my daily morning walk. I will present Picioni's work through a series of main ideas of conceptual themes. Some are supported by his own writing, some are read into his work by others such as Frant and uh, Zonis and Cotionis, and some are my own observations. So I, I, I would like to I'm going to circle around the same subjects that uh, Alexandra uh, looked at, but from a different vantage point. So I, I, would, I would like us to understand Picionis and his time and try to get into his mind as much as possible after the fact. So Picionis practiced in a time of great tension. Greece had just come out from a very destructive World War II and a very destructive civil war. And it was uh, a society that not only had gone through great loss very recently, but was still under great political tension. At the same time as this sort of very difficult story, uh, Greece was trying to freshen up and rebrand itself and bring in the tourism industry and become sort of reconnected or more strongly connected with antiquity both as a cultural project and as economic touristic project. And it is exactly at this time where these sort of difficult paths of, of history meet that Picionis is called to do his work. So the task is not as, as, as straightforward as one would think because there, <coughs> there has not been a historical landscape around the Acropolis recently. And th this, is, this is the Acropolis in the 1700s and it's sort of just you know, pasture land, uh, the Acropolis itself part of a, a, of a living village. Um, this is 
the 1880s, early 1900s, and what you see as sort of um, b big areas of, of, of earthen mounds is the material that was taken out of the Acropolis and dumped. So it's sort of, you know, peeling back the layers of history and just dumping them all, all over the site. And this is what existed of the landscape. And by the time that Picciones was called in to do his work in the 50s, there was sort of, you know, a bit of growing vegetation. And there has there had been an attempt since the 1930s to design and redesign the access to Greece's most important monument. But basically, at the time, it was a, a road, a wide road for cars and buses. And it is exactly, if, if, you, if you look at the plan that Picciones follows, it's, it's the same plan, but with a change of materiality. But he, he rejects the idea that you should be, he, he rejected on, 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 on grounds of principle. You should not be able to reach the Acropolis by car, you should have to walk up to it. And you should have, you know, you should have this experience. And similarly, going up to Lubardiaris uh, and, and to the vantage point in uh, Filopapu, which used to be a car road, he, he takes the same approach of keeping the road but changing the materiality and forcing you to read it in a different way. So. What I will do now is I will go through the walk quickly because to do it justice, you know, we ha it has to be an hour long walk, but I'll, I'll, I'll go quicker to give you an experience for those of you who have not had this amazing experience and then focus on the ideas that might be significant in understanding it. So this is the center of Athens. This is the, um, oops, okay, there we go. So th this is, this is uh, Sindagma. This is the neoclassical triangle. This is whatever remains of the medieval fabric. But it used to wrap around the Acropolis, but it was uh, torn down for the excavations of the, of the Agora. The Acropolis and Philopapos, which is sort of the, the green center of uh, a built up Athens. And the area that Picionis was given as a project is over here. And as you, you walk the walk today, well, when, 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 when he configured his project, uh, Dionisio Rapagitu was a car street with asphalt, and m most of you remember that. It's since been turned into a very successful pedestrian way, but as, as, as you walk along this road, certain strange things start to happen. Mm -hmm. For example, the paving starts to develop inexplicable motifs. And you have something that looks like it should be made of wood. This is a wooden construction language, but it's actually made out of marble. Mm -hmm. So if, you, if you're not clued into what is happening, you just start, well, you have to read a bit of architecture, but you, have, you start to wonder what is going on. And then little pieces that look like they're part of a rock or part of something ancient start to appear in the um, steps going up to uh, the, Irodis Atikos uh, Theater. And what is extremely interesting is that these steps gently wrap around and become terraced walls that would be typical in most you know, Greek uh, landscapes. These tie in to existing rock formations as well as ancient walls and they form the ground for olive groves. So you have a ki ki kind of a a seamless transition of things that seem like they've always been there, but in fact, most of them have been choreographed. They've been orchestrated by Picciones to tell a story. And everything happens under the very you know, heavy presence of the Acropolis. It's difficult. I, I don't know how many people would have the guts and the spirit to pull something of this caliber off under you know, one of the most greatest and most difficult monuments. On, on Earth. So as, as you walk along, there are many of these little paths going up. And what is characteristic is, as, as uh, Alexander was saying, the edges are never sharp. There's always things going in and out of the landscape and a connection to what, what is there. And the sense that the paths you know, came into a landscape that was pre-existing. But in fact, most of this, is, if not all of this, has been choreographed by Picionis and his uh, his uh, group. And as, as far as I've been able to identify, for example, this famous tree that, that um, the path moves around was actually planted there. So there's, you know, there's a choreography of <laughs> wa walking around nature. 
uh, and, and but extremely respectfully done. So this is one of the main ways of walking up to the entrance of the Acropolis and you keep having these little events of marble steps turning into marble, sort of a marble planter uh, with a bit of rock and another bit of rock you know, turning into a low wall. Most of it is one material, marble, but used in, 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 in ways that suggest that it could be new, it could be old, it could have been there forever. Um, and then you, know, you, you, you rise slowly up towards the Acropolis. Uh, there are little paths coming in from other directions such as the Erodion. Uh, it's interesting how a small path will meet a big path, not losing its identity but sort of inscribing itself as something separate uh, up to the very end. And uh, what Alexander was describing as the sort of the water gutters with a very strong design presence um, in many locations. And then you're, you're, you're considerably <coughs> constantly surrounded by this nature that seems like it's always been there. So another main wave coming up is what used to be and still is the car access. And there Picionis has created a much stronger choreography of, of found objects that are, are probably antique uh, recycled stone from uh, neoclassical buildings being torn down um, and you know material picked up from from the quarries and there are definite references to classical not neoclassical but classical architecture so it, it looks like it could have maybe been there from antiquity but but it wasn't and then this large this white path moves up with beautiful paving moments that focus your eye and suggest that something is happening, but it's mysterious. You never know exactly what is happening. You just feel that something is happening. Um, the, the, the gutters that form part of the water history. And then at some points, little, little paths going in and out. And then at other points, the paving pattern becomes much simpler and you're kind of left to wander without focusing down and, and, and looking around. But then when moments, when critical moments appear, things change. So as you're about to turn around to, to look at the Acropolis, uh, the story becomes much more animated and there are many more of these uh, objects and, and the geometries become much more interesting. And again, as Alexander was saying, there are the very wide um, there's the use of white joints, but as you see, the white joints are not a general device here. They're used to mark sort of uh, the, the center where, where water might collect. So it's the very beginning of a water story. Or they're used to mark out of many stones uh, a square which is equivalent to one of the graves that was found. And a lot of these are events that you, you read some significance into them, but you don't understand exactly, exactly what and why. And then there's the device of shifting the movement of the stone to take you around corners and guide your body and your, your, your vision uh, into different uh, directions until you, you start to turn around and can actually go up towards the, the final bit towards the Acropolis. And again, you keep having a sense that you don't know what came first, the vegetation, uh, the, the, the rocks, the, uh, the, the paving, but everything keeps telling you that it's part of one story. So thinking back to you know, modernism, which, where the building and nature are two separate things, sometimes looking at each other, this is exactly the opposite. Everything comes together into a kind of, of a unity. And, you know, as you're about to look up and you've almost reached the steps of the Acropolis, that's where it becomes the most elaborate. And in my view, it's one of the few areas that might just not work as well as others because there's, you know, may maybe a bit too much uh, going on, but it's still m magical. And, you, you, you know, you feel the presence of, of everything. And then one of my sort of let's say all-time favorite moments is this very sensitive little path 
that leads you to the steps up to Arios Pagos, which is where uh, St. Paul preached the new God and the new religion to the Athenians. So here you are actually, it's one of the few places, I guess, on earth where you can actually follow on the footsteps of one of the apostles. And this is what Picionis has done to lead you there. Just the, the slightest, most sensitive, you know, meek but, but strong way of getting there. And then going back down towards Philopapu, you have a strong, you have these uh, sort of, Picionis doesn't use curves usually. He, he, he kind of goes for, for straight and jagged. So he rejects, let's say, the English 17th century idea of pastoral beauty. Uh, and from what I've been able to understand, he, he gets this jagged geometry from the plan of ancient Athens. Athens was not a city, ancient Athens was not a city of, of winding streets, it was a city of jagged streets. And by this play of, of, of straight lines that turn your vision around, it, it becomes much, there's much more tension and much more drama than something that kind of uh, winds gently through. And even when he's following a winding road, such as the pre-existing one for, for the buses, he establishes certain sight lines that take you and then you know, break you and lead you up to the Philopapus monument, for example. This is the famous Picionis traffic island where various, th you know, th it's almost, almost a microcosm of, of what we've seen previously where rocks and uh, marble and, and trees come together in a very beautiful and sensitive and powerful way. And actually a lot of this looks like paintings. I mean, you, 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 can, you can sit there for 20 minutes and take photos and most of them will look like parts of paintings. They're extremely beautifully done. And this is the main way up to um, sort of the, the vantage point over the Vyatihisma. And there's the pedestrian paths which have a uh, sort of a, a rhythm with, with steps and, and what could still be a vehicle pa path which is the wider road. With these very strange uh, you know, things appearing which are part marble, part concrete and look ancient, but not really. I mean, if you, if you know antiquity, you realize they're not ancient, but they're, they're, they're doing something interesting. Um, with things that keep tying and referring back to the land and back to the rock. And the first appearance of concrete, which is the contemporary material. So not a rejection of the contemporary condition, but so, you know, careful, careful insertion and, and careful use. And devices such as these very long uh, sort of joints and um, connectors that go from out from the landscape into the main road and then back out into the landscape. Uh, and then architecture, that Alexandra already talked about with uh, Lubardiaris and its relationship to the Diatichisma gate and the Vipilon, where Picionis' entrance to Lubadiaris is exactly on the Yatichisma gate line. So he's creating a gate, he's creating the, the small contemporary religious gate on top of the, exactly on the line of the ancient um, city gates, and tying together many elements again in a way that is not clear of what era they are always extremely effective and taking you into Lobadiaris where the, the sort of the same paving mentality comes from outside the church into the church so the church is always part of the universe all the way into the altar and uh, th this is the, the the kiosk from which you were supposed to see the view but since the trees have grown and and you don't but with extremely s strong and clear references to classical architecture but still in a way that could never be considered a copy of antiquity. It's always a, a, a reinterpretation, a dynamic reinterpretation. And the, uh, a condition where you know, the, the natural elements such as wood, or the, let's say living elements such as wood and, and living plants are part of the architecture. 
and then back out with the little water channels starting to collect what is a bigger water story uh, and continuing with concrete becoming an ever more present and again in inexplicable um, element that reminds us of the paintings of, of Morales for example but this is before Morales started doing his his work a strong story of the water so even when the actual water is not present on, present on the landscape you read its importance through these um, these channels that eventually lead it to disappear under an ancient cut which was the, b the back of a building and into a, a katavothra kind of in, into a place where the water disappears into the underworld in a way and then you know, continuing up the Philopapu hill with very evocative plays between stone and concrete. Looking down at Piraeus, which was um, Picionis' birthplace, and up at the monument of uh, Philopapos, passing through cut rock, because this was, this was part of the actual uh, urban fabric of ancient Athens, so these are the bases of ancient buildings, where the native rock and the Picionis path just seem to blend into one thing. And up a little path, although this is the main way to go to the main place, it, you wouldn't really know it. You have to be a bit sensitive to follow that path, which is actually part of an ancient staircase leading to a house where a simple piece of marble has been placed by Picionis and his team just to add that one more element that will make it a staircase that will eventually lead you up through a little path on top of the Viatihisma and then to the most famous view of the Acropolis with clear references from that language back to this language. So it's what in you know, Japanese gardens you would call a borrowed landscape, where you use devices in the foreground to feel that you're in the sp same mental space as something in the distance. Uh, the, the place at which your body stops to see this view, the thresholds that he has created is exactly on the line of the wall. So he's, I mean, this is a tiny device, it's just two steps, but, t two steps, but these two steps are enough to stop, your, to stop you in your tracks so that you have the, 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 the big view of the Acropolis on the significant moment that you're re-entering the ancient city. And then Alexandra has spoken about most of this, but a, a path that starts to reappear as a cut in a, a landscape that looks like it's man-made and natural at the same time, and is very clearly connected to uh, you know, the, the, the native rock, and which eventually takes you back down through the ancient walls and back down into the city. So th that was the walk and now comes an attempt to understand what we've just seen from certain perspectives and, and certain ideas. First has to do with the relationship between antiquity, modernity, and identity. Because especially those of you in the crowd who are Greek will recognize that there is within contemporary Greek culture a sense of um, insecurity, maybe, about rela the relationship to our history and, and, and historical continuity. Especially since there, there, there were at times, um, you know, people like Falmerayer who have uh, questioned this continuity. So th there is, in the formation of the contemporary Greek state, uh, 1840s and 1850s, a very clear project to refer it back to classical antiquity. This is Schinkel's plan for the palace on the Acropolis, which is a, an amazing project that fortunately never got realized. <laughs> um, but this is, this is the, 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 the trilogy, 
And most important buildings in Greece, in Athens at the time, uh, are elaborated in the neoclassical language to connect you back to classical antiquity. And, you know, the simple house does the same in, in the neoclassical language. Uh, and th there is, even in, in the generation of the 30s, uh, a, a very strong, I would say, even spiritual connection to, to classicism and classical antiquity. But at the same time, uh, as, as all of this is happening, and this, for example, is, is, this is exactly the same time as Picionis is, is doing the Acropolis Wall. This is Ralph Griswold's. Uh, design for the landscaping of the ancient Agora for the American School of Classical Studies in Athens. And I would be interested at some point to see if the two men had any kind of sort of, you know, exchange of, of ideas. But at the same time that this emphasis on classicism is, is tying Greece to the past or maybe a, a bit after, uh, modernism enters the scene and it enters it especially quickly with the Asia Minor disaster and the, the refugee uh, issue. And it becomes, par excellence, the language of, of modern Greece. I mean, people who know modern Greece today know that it's, it's, it's modernism that is the visual uh, sort of language of, of, of modern Greece. And Picioni starts by being a very clear modernist. But then, um, Constantinidis, for example, but then, as, as we know, sort of steps back and says, wait a minute. And what Picionis introduces is a language that is neither, it's clearly not modernist because he's, he's rejected it on paper and, 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 and in writing, but it's also not really, um, it's, it's, it's not a cop copy paste of historical things. It's, it's, it's a new kind of language that is pulling different things together in a way that is not fully explainable. You don't read it quickly. You don't understand exactly what's going on. So that makes it much more interested, interesting. So the next idea that might help us to understand what is going on is an idea of going from fragments to unity. So this is very clear in this photo where most of these are fragments, and some of them are fragments that you can clearly see have been reused from something else, but they're being pulled into a composition that tells you that all of this is part of the same universe. So it's not talking about fragmentation, you know, sort of in the multicultural sense, but it's talking about unification in, in culture and perhaps not, not, not just in culture. Uh, you know, this continues with using these very small pieces to create unity between an ancient path and, and the steps that you're going to take today, or the way uh, concrete is unified with stone in these, these compositions, or the way that the steps are unified with the uh, earth retaining walls, or the, the way that many different recycled materials are unified into the Lubardiaris facades. Um, or the way that, you know, very lay um, traditions are brought into the project. And what is interesting for me, and, and, and it's, it's, it, it also comes out very clearly in, in Picionis' drawings that it, it's, you know, this is, this is created uh, to have this effect. So what's interesting for me is that if if you think of Athens, especially pre-modern Athens, before the 1950s, it is a city that has been recomposing itself of fragments for the last two and a half thousand years at least. So even the, the walls of the Acropolis are recycled fragments from earlier temples and earlier walls that were, were torn down, mainly by the Persians. So this idea of you know, recycling the old to make the new is as, as Athenian as it gets, right? So my reading is not that, that Picionis' recycling is uh, a new language to deal with a new problem. He's to a large degree recognizing what has been the Athenian condition for millennia and doing it in a very new, interesting and, and effective way.
Another type of unity is unity with nature that Alexandra already touched on. Uh, these are photos of Alexandra's father from the 1960s and 70s of the vegetation around the Acropolis. And what is interesting to me as, as sort of a landscape architect and a, and a landscape ecologist is that at the time, most of the forestation programs were done with pines, with, with a monoculture, um, uh, you know, brought about by forestry thinking. And that's not what Picionis and his group do. They, they, they use a variety of different plants native to the Attic uh, landscape. And he has specific writings as he travels through the Attic landscape, you know, exalting these plants. Um, so there's a, there's a very clear idea that they're trying to recreate a kind of archetypal Attic nature. Again, most of, most of this is, you know, it's, 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 it's done uh, anew. And the sense that you get every single moment is that you, you cannot see where humanity stops and where nature starts. So there's a, a continuous sense that we are all part of the same system. Another story which has been suggested by uh, Volos University professor Zizis Kotionis is the idea of the river, or the river of life. Because Kotionis looks at this, the various sort of riverine forms and flows, especially the various gutters that appear. Um, and reads into them a story which is equivalent to the way water was treated in the Renaissance Italian villas, which is it describes the journey of life from birth mm -hmm. to death. And, and Cotionis actually sees all of this as part of that story and thinks of the Katavothra, where all of this ends, as the place where your, your soul goes down to Hades. So it is the ancient Greek idea that, you know, through a watery way, your soul goes to the underworld. And then perhaps the final idea, which is, which is my reading, is what I call from the rock, because um, Athenian foundation mythology, uh, Erichthonios, who is the first human in Athens, he's the founder of, of Athens, is a half man, half snake, and he comes out of the ground and out of the rock. So humans are autochthonous. They are born there out of the rock. And it seems to me that even the Acropolis is a kind of thesis about going from you know, pure nature to man-made nature, and then ever more up to you know, the same material is, it goes from, from rough and natural to more man-made and to more and more sort of intellectual and Apollonian. And it seems very clear to me that Picionis thinks of the rock as the foundation for everything else. And a lot of his path system, even the, the bits that are clearly sort of marble placed in paving patterns, feels like native rock. So it seems to me that what guides all of this story is an overall spirit of unity unity in the sense of the fragment becoming a whole so you could you could see that in human terms or cultural terms unity with nature so we are not separate from that system we are part of that system and it is part of us unity of identity and cultural continuity within the greek story and also a very strong metaphysical sense and what I kept most strongly from Alexandra's presentation was the idea that Picionis was a meek man. And I'm called to think that as in the case of Gandhi, Picionis is a testament to the amazing, unstoppable power of sensitivity and meekness. Thank you.